Okay, everybody. Okay? All right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming along today. Um, I'll introduce myself quickly first. I'm Jennifer Hughes. I'm an FCC board member. And in my day job, I'm a columnist for Breaking Views, which is Reuters' financial commentary arm. I mean, I've covered finance markets, companies for 20 odd years, for 20 -odd years now, and the last 10 of them have been in Asia. Before I introduce our speaker for today, just a couple of housekeeping announcements just to let you know what's coming up. Next Wednesday, the 17th, we've got another lunch event called Call the Salvage Man um, by a speaker who has actually fished a 747 out of Hong Kong Harbor. So if you want to know what that looks like, sign up for that lunch. On Tuesday the 23rd, we have an 8 a.m. Zoom event. It will be available on YouTube for the late risers. Um, called The Future of the Newsroom. That's with Gina Chua, a senior colleague of mine at Reuters, uh, talking about news and how we'll gather it in future. And later on the 23rd, we've got a speed mentoring event for really for early career journalists um, to give them access to senior colleagues to ask questions. So if you know any and any early career types here, please sign up for that one. Now, moving on today's, to today's event. Um, Harold is an FCC member and I'm sure is known to many of you anyway. He's been with HSBC for 15 plus years now? 15, 16, 17 maybe going? Yeah. Lots of years. Yeah. Um, He's currently Chief Asia Equity Strategist, and his book, Asia Stock Markets from the Ground Up, was published last month as a beginner's guide to the region's stock markets, and a really, really very jargon-free one for those of you who aren't a markets nerd like me. Um, and it's actually his second book after one on Jakarta's history, which was published last year, wasn't it? A year and a half ago. Yeah, that's right. We'll ask you later how you managed to fit the book writing around the day job. <laughs> but... Um, and of course, we will leave time for audience questions, so please have some ready, and the usual will start. But look, we'll start with big picture, and you can take it where you will. Um, I think it's very apt that we're talking about your new book here, given it that it was the risks of trade with Asia that led various companies to end up developing stock markets in Europe. The first markets came about as the result of the risk of trade with this region. But we'll come back to the history if we get time. Um, but can you sort of start by setting the scene for us in the region now? Who moves the markets in Asia and really what moves them? What moves them? Actually, history is, is, is quite helpful actually here. Uh, so you're right. It were the Dutch that traded with Asia and needed money and invented something called the stock market. What happened is that a bunch of people came together and said, we're going to buy a ship seal it off, wait for two years, hopefully it comes back, might get burned, killed in the process or storms or whatever, and if it comes back, we reap the profits and we share it. So the Dutch started to do that. The only problem is that they were starting to do all sorts of infighting. We're very good in that in Holland. So eventually somebody came together and says, it doesn't make sense. We're all fighting, trying to get to that port first and try to kick somebody else out or blocking the port for another ship to come in. The Portuguese are benefiting from this. Why don't we put it all together? And, uh, and if we do it all together, we all get the profits from all the different expeditions. And let's do that for the next 22 years. And actually, let's put it on paper and actually then sell it. Now, that was on the 1st of April, 1602. And this is the key concept. You get a series of payments in markets, and you have to discount that over time. So if what drives markets, you actually go back to that particular concept. So what drives the payments of these markets? A lot of people, if they start to talk about analyzing markets, they talk about GDP and the economy does this and that. In particular in Asia, my view is that we don't really have to look at that. There's a massive uh, kind of disparity between what the economies are and what the markets are. Taiwan's GDP can go up and down, but 90% of the profits generated by the Taiwanese corporates are not sold in Taiwan. So Taiwan can do well, it doesn't do anything though for their businesses. So the vast majority is sold everywhere in the world. So you gotta understand what drives the profits of these companies and what is the profile of that and how do you discount that back? So that's the two drivers. Now then the question is, what drives those profits of these companies? 
Ah, then you come to say, well, profit growth. And what drives the profit growth? Well, actually, yes, the economy helps, but there's also other trends. For a retailer, it could be demographics. Uh, for a car sailor, probably also demographics. For other companies, it's maybe new technology or regulations. So you actually have to dig down much deeper, which is the subtitle of the book, From the Ground Up. Let's look at these markets from the ground up and see what constitute these markets and what drives it. So you go back to long themes of, yeah, demographics, regulations, technology, and these sort of things. The rising wealth of the middle classes. Rising wealth of the middle yeah. classes is a very good one. Now, that all sounds quite vague, right? Okay, demographics, what's the number of people in the next 10 years? Uh, how, how rich will these people be? Of course, then you have to translate that back again into some things that are very usable right now. So what is the actual profit forecast for countries over the next 12 months? Turns out for next year, it's about in Asia on average 9, 10%. Some countries grow very fast, Indonesia, India, some very slow, Taiwan, Korea. You can look at what, what the difference is. And then you have to look at, yeah, we're looking at future profits. How do you discount that? So you have to look at the bond market. So there was somebody, you want to talk about the bond, but just very quickly, somebody once said, um, in the mornings you say, um, how's the Dow? That used to be a comment in, uh, in, in the US. I think that's a wrong start of the day. You don't look at what the Dow Jones does because actually it's a very bad index. You look at the S&P 500, but actually you should look at what happens at the bond market first. Yeah. What happens there and how do we translate that back in to, uh, into the stock market? When I moved to Hong Kong 10 years ago, um, that did become my starting point for the day. What's the 10 year US Treasury yield doing? Yeah. And that was it. Now, bringing it right up to the present day and one thing I think all of us here with any interest in financial markets or investments are reading a lot about is inflation yeah. right now. Now, what's your view on this? Because what we're hearing or what I'm reading is that central banks aren't worried. They say it's transitory. They don't need to raise rates. Of course, the other side of that is the risk that they are behind the curve. Yeah. What do so, you think we need to do? Yeah. So inflation is a key topic. Why? Because that actually determines bond yields as well. So. Uh, and what is happening with inflation? Prices have increased year on year. Now, there's a camp who says we're in a transitory stage. There's temporary inflation coming through. And to be honest, I'm in that camp as well. But I must admit that we are pushing that into, uh, into further into the future. So we're coming semi-permanent. Even the central bank, the Fed has said, well, it's maybe a bit more permanent and less transient than we initially anticipated. Um, but the month-on-month -month inflation numbers seem to have declined. Actually, tomorrow evening we get a number out. Uh, it's all about car sales in the U.S. and rental uh, prices in the U.S. If they're going to offset one and another, don't have to go into technicalities. But it could be that inflation is going to uh, peak out. And maybe we've just had a, a post-COVID recovery in the world. A lot of people are back, demanding stuff again. We have bottlenecks in supply, we know. The factories can't just keep it up, and you have more supply than demand, and, oh, sorry, more demand than supply, and that drives off these prices, and some adjustment will come through over time. The central bank's got to be careful, because we've, had, we've been in this situation three or four times over the last 10 years, whereby the market says, you need to raise interest rates. Inflation's coming through. It's don't be behind the curve. They raised interest rates only to find out that actually they did it too early, and they threw out the baby with the bathwater. They killed it. Be growth be before it even was coming through. So I think they'd like to be a little bit careful this time around just to make sure that, that they don't make the same mistake as in the past. What would it take to, to make you think it really was a more permanent feature of the landscape than we thought? What would it take? Do we need prices to rise very sharply or to just price rise rate, the growth rate not to subside? What would it take? To make you I worry. think there's two things I would look at. First of all, uh, we need to see over the next couple of months if these numbers really are coming down. And if that's not the case, then there's a red kind of cross behind that, right? Maybe we're wrong. The other thing is we're looking at investment trends because supply needs to catch up. I mean, as we just said, the demand is stronger than supply. Uh, so supply needs to catch up. And we see that in certain industries, but not everywhere. And it's not as easy. Right? So you've seen the oil industry, that uh, supply is rising. So that probably puts a lid on oil prices. But we don't see that in other industries. So let's figure out how that works out. And we see investment coming back. At the moment, there's very little sign of that either. So you're going to give central banks the benefit of the doubt for now? You're well, the for the point. moment, yeah. yeah. Now, you mentioned bond yields, and I flipped to inflation. But coming back to that, 
in your book, you do talk about the importance of bond deals to Asian markets. Do yeah. you want to just explain that one a little bit more? Yeah. So very often we talk about interest rates in markets. And interest rates are important because basically I'd like profits now, but if I buy a company, I also have right on profits in 5, 10, 15 years. But I need to discount that because they're less important, and we use interest rates for that. So we have to specify what interest rates are important to us. If we talk about central banks raising interest rates maybe next year or 2023, we're talking about interest rates that are set on a one-year or six-month basis. That's not too relevant, to be extremely for me, because I've still got a right to the profits in five or ten years' time, right? So I typically look at a 10-year bond yield. Um, the story with that 10-year bond yield is that over the last, uh, what is it now, 30 years, it has relentlessly come down. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody's in the room who had a mortgage in, uh, say, the UK or in the US in 1985. Uh, it was not cheap. Mortgage rates were 18%, I believe, at one point in time. Just judging Very expensive. by the audience here, I think we have some nodding going on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Remember so they remember how much you paid. So these, these rates have consistently come down. Now the market now says, yeah, if central banks are going to raise interest rates, these bond yields need to go up as well. But there is something more going on than just an economy being good or central banks raising interest rates. These bond, longer term bond yields are coming down. We've got to understand why that is the case. And I think this comes back to what we said earlier on demographics. There's a lot of middle aged older people uh, in, in the world. <laughs> and Not just this room. Yeah, no, exactly. I thought I'd just say in this world. And what do, what do people do at, at that point in time? They're not going to punt on, on, uh, on stocks anymore. They're not going to punt on, on Bitcoin. They put their money in something safe whereby they know, hey, for the next 10 years, I just get a stable income out of it. So you get a lot of money going into what we call fixed income instruments. And that determines interest rates. So that pushes these interest rates down. So we have to understand that particular process as well. Because that is the interest rate that we use to discount the profits that we get from a company. So central banks might raise interest rates now, but as I said, that's, that's, I don't really use that to say, hey, I need to discount the future profit stream that I get. I need to look at these 10-year bond yields, and there's something really special going on there. So we've got low 10-year yields, and when we're looking at future profits for, say, 5, 10 years out, mm -hmm. using that rate gives us a bigger number for those yep. profits. Yep. Is there a risk that we're creating a false sense of prosperity here? I mean... I just about remember the time when the 10-year yield was maybe around 4%. We're what? I'm going to say 1.5, and, and I should have checked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I got no, up to fine. Yeah, yeah. roughly 1.5. Yep. Well, it's 1.47. It was very close. Yeah, very close. <laughs> I really didn't check, and I meant to. <laughs> um, is there a risk that it gives us a false sense of prosperity? Because we're looking in the future. And we're just counting those profits, but they still look pretty good. Mm -hmm but we get a rise in the 10-year yield, or rates come back to what I would call normal levels, which these are not, these are low. Mm. Is there a risk? There is a risk. There's a long-term risk, absolutely. So the valuation of stock markets in the US, for example, in Asia that's a little bit less so, is very, very high. We can explain it by saying, hey, yeah, the, 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 we, we, we discount these future profits by so little now, and the interest rates are so low. So it is justified. The question is, will this continue? No, I think part of the explanation is that, as I said, you have a whole generation uh, in front of most of us uh, that is uh, the baby boomers that put their money into these fixed income instruments. As, yeah, as these demographics change over the next 10, maybe 15 years, it could well be that those dynamics change and that these bond yields drift higher again. That, that might well be the case. But at the moment, we don't see that. So you get a... A strange situation whereby these valuations in these stock markets are extremely high, justified on yeah, the parameters, the things that we have at the moment, the profits and the, and the, and the bond yields. Is that sustainable is, is another question altogether. Maybe in the very long run, not. But we think probably for the next five years, probably yes. Yeah, We can live with that. Okay. No. I did want to switch and talk about um, the country that we all spend so much time talking about here, China. Mm. And... Um, We'll all have seen news since, what, roughly July, about a series of regulatory crackdowns. Mm. And um, it was you know, not to mention uh, Xi Jinping's emphasis since August on common prosperity and what he means by that. You know, we've seen some investors, usually based overseas, basically saying that China is uninvestable. Mm. What would you say to that? 
Well, I've, I've spoken with some of those investors and said China is uninvestable. They're wrong because you can invest. Uninvestable means you can't invest in it. Well, if you actually give money to your broker and you say you want to buy it, you can invest in China. So in that sense, they're wrong. The thing is that the Chinese market is not behaving exactly as they wanted it to be. Very often, those were the people that were really into some of the large internet companies there and have really burned their fingers. So uh, I can understand that that is not very nice for them, but you can invest. But we do need to acknowledge that Asian stock markets just behave differently than the US. So I said earlier on, uh, in the US, you can say, hey, GDP is this, and this is what happens with the economy, and these sectors will do well. There's, there's a little bit of an overlap there. That is not the case in Asia. So throw out that economic analysis and look at it from the bottom up. What are the companies that are the major players in the index? What do they do? What is their profits? And what is their prospects, right? And then start from that base. Now, does that mean that, uh, for example, internet is large in China? Is that completely surprising? I actually had a, a debate by somebody about two or three years ago in quite nicely in Nassau, in the Bahamas, is a very nice location, about will there, will there be regulations in internet? And we came to discussion when we talked about it. It is very likely that that is the case. We've seen this with banks. We've seen this with Macau Gaming, maybe slightly differently. We've seen this with mobile telephony in, uh, in, in China as well. These, these sectors rallied quite a lot. And then they had a big reset and were semi-regulated or sometimes deliberalized. And it changed the dynamics. Could that, we said two years ago, happen with China internet? Yes, it could. When? We don't know. We just have to deal with it when it comes. So um, I also think, actually, that last year, 12 months ago, the expectations in the market for some of these companies were unrealistic. So we actually became nervous on, on that particular sector. Literally, in mid-November last year, said, everybody expect these companies to grow another 30 40% for the next couple of years. That is probably not sustainable. So um, we... We said maybe we should be a little bit careful with that sector. Okay, so being careful on China tech stocks is one thing. The other sector, I mean, we're all hearing a lot about right now is obviously the property markets oh, yeah. in Asia. The trouble, or in, sorry, in China, China particularly. particularly yeah. The developers, the troubles of people like Evergrande, Kaiser, who are struggling to pay their bonds and their debts on time. Um, is this something we should be worried about more widely? Do you think the sector is sunk? Mm -hmm. What next? So I said earlier on, we've had China mobile phones in 2006 and 2007 rallying, doing very well. It had a reset and flatline for 10 years. Macau Gaming did exactly the same kind of thing. Internet, banks. The question is, does property actually the same? Are we going to in an area whereby actually the property growth prospects are just structurally reset in, in China? We've had fantastic growth. That might well actually be the case. I just read this morning that the uh, total amount of floor space in China is not equal to that in Europe. I don't know who measured that. There's a lot of work, I suspect, but let's assume that's the case. So the story that the property sector, there's a lot of property need to be built, that story is to a certain extent over. In addition to that, of course, we now have certain companies falling over. They've got all sorts of cash flow problems. And the problem is if you're in China and you want to buy a flat, you got to put up, I think it's some, some, very often 90% of the purchase price you got to put up front. If that developer is going bankrupt, that money is gone. So a lot of people are extremely nervous for good reasons to buy property now. So you're going to have a situation probably for the next couple of months whereby some of these developers struggle to sell any product because everybody's extremely nervous. So confidence needs to come back. On the other hand, you can buy companies that we can't guarantee, but with a very high likelihood, we'll still be around in about five years or maybe 10 years' time at three times earnings. Three times earnings. I used to cover Indonesian stocks in the mid late, late 90s. I mean, I have not seen stocks this cheap since the late 1990 days in Indonesia when nobody wanted to invest in it. So the question is, how much of that is priced in? Are you willing to take a bet on a company that really struggles now and can you sit through it and are willing to take that risk? And uh, that's something that everybody personally needs to ask himself, can I do that? But if you're, uh, if you're willing to take risk, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, take I have a, a feeling minute. some of the audience might be asking you when we get to the audience Q&A what you think, <laughs> whether you'd be willing to take that bet. Yeah. Um, well, look, so property sector beaten down cheap at the moment, or can be cheap or still a risk. Uh, 
tech stocks, at least they've come down from their highs and possibly, as you say, flatlining for a few years to come. Um, goodness knows what I'm going to find to write about every day if you're right on both of those, believe me. <laughs> Look, we've had another, I mean, the other big U, uh, so China theme is obviously the US-China tensions. Mm. And we've now got the US effectively warning that Chinese companies are very likely to be delisted from the US. We've got this homecoming thing going yep. on. Is that something that offers opportunities to people? Does In a it sense, mean much? I think there's two sides, two, two sorts of opportunities I would attach to this. So first of all, um, if companies list in the US, you have an opportunity to buy them there as well. If they come and list in Hong Kong, the opportunity is pretty much the same unless if for whatever reason you couldn't buy stock in the US. So that is not necessarily a, a new opportunity. Um, but we do see companies here, and there will be companies benefiting from that. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange, for example, <laughs> will, uh, will benefit from that. But I think there's another set of opportunities. This is part, simply, of an increased rivalry between these two nations. And that will probably go on for most of our lifetimes, if not all of it. Uh, this, this, this is going to go on for quite some time. Um, what we see is that you see industrial adjustments taking place. In China, there's increased focus on self-sufficiency. In certain products, they see themselves as strategically weak. Semiconductors, food, uh, energy. China sources most of its energy from the Middle East. Uh, that's why it is one of the reasons why it makes a push in, for example, renewables. That makes them less, uh, I would say, that, dependent on, on external suppliers. So in all of these sorts of industries, they say, let's, let's try to create an environment whereby people can catch up and do that ourselves. Now, that is easier said than done. Uh, there's a very large semiconductor company uh, that 20 years ago wanted to compete with the Taiwanese giants and is still well behind. It's very difficult to do so. But in other industries, they've done well. So that focus on some of these industries that trying to create self-reliance means that there is policies being developed to grow these industries. And it's very often the component makers in those industries, the ones who make wind turbines or inverters for solar panels, solar glass, uh, all these kind of companies that benefit from that. So that's an opportunity that you can also, hey, I can, I can look at that and, and, and buy and so invest in that. Break down and go down the supply chain. Go down the supply chain and see which companies could actually benefit from that. And if China says we want to have renewables is very important to us, good. We want to have a lot of solar uh, panels being installed everywhere. We provide subsidies, good. 80% of all the solar panels in the world, I think it's actually 90%, um, is made, are made in China by two companies. Now, you can look at both of them and say, who is going to benefit? It doesn't really matter too much in this case. I mean, the two companies who are most likely going to benefit from it. So it makes sense to take a look at those companies. Yeah. I'm going to step back for a second and go back to a couple of the big themes. I mean, you mentioned demographics earlier, and I know that's something you've sort of been focused on mm. recently in your work. What are the big shifts or changes you're seeing and how will how should we think about those in the context of investing in Asia? So when we talk about Chinese or Asian demographics, most people start off, oh, Chinese demographics are bad. They're not bad. It's like the weather. I like this hiking weather, a bit cooler and dry. I like that. If I were a farmer, I don't like dry and cool weather. I want it wet and hot. It's much better for my crops. So what is good or bad is, is dependent on who you are. So it is with demographics. It's not about if they're good or bad. It is what they are. It's how well we prepared to deal with these changes in demographics. Now, there are two big shifts. First of all, India, in, by 2024, will become bigger in, than China, which probably in India will be either alarmist, like, oh my god, we got so many people, what are we going to do with it? Or, hey, we are bigger than China, we wanted to be bigger than China, whatever it is. So that's, but there will, be, uh, there will be one big change. Secondly, the biggest, what I believe is the biggest demographic trend on the planet, actually, is happening in China. China is aging. The average Chinese is close to 40. So in 10 years, it will be close to 50. Now, myself, my wife, we are prime examples. We're not Chinese, but our son has just left home. That's something that happens if you're somewhere between 40s and 50s. Your children leave. In China, you got one child. So, hey, he leaves. You're on your own. You're with the two of you. This is exactly what happened with us as well. What that happens is you got one bedroom that's opened up, and your wife says, oh, that's nice, a walk-in closet. I say, hey, 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 no, no, no. This is going to be my library. 
<laughs> so we're actually going to do refurbishing, and we have a bit of a fight going on. So home refurbishing is very important for people there. So you see a lot of changes in the family structure in China. Empty nesters, children are leaving. These people have done very well. They have uh, graduated from university, say, around 1990. They had a couple of years of experience when the WTO opened and they had a, a starting career. They've saved their money, they've done well, they got a car, they got a house. So what are they gonna spend money on? Home improvement? Uh, they're gonna spend money on yoga classes, maybe? That's what middle-aged men in Lycra kind of stuff do, but that's what's gonna happen. That's not an image we need. That's not an image that we need to protect here, necessarily, so. Um, healthcare, they gotta save for pensions, so wealth management. So you see big trends taking place in China. Now, the number, the number of these uh, Chinese empty nesters compared to a similar kind of group in the US. So we're talking about people between 40 to 64 earning, say, $50,000 and more. So they're affluent empty nesters. Is a third now in the US. By the end of this decade, there will be more than in the US. So it's a very fast growing market. And we know roughly what these people do home improvement, uh, lycra, <laughs> uh, sportswear. Um, uh, travel, experiences. So then using that, you can say, hey, in the consumer sector, are there companies that could benefit from this? Or refrigeration makers, or companies that sell air conditionings, or massage chairs. Yeah. Okay, so that's the empty nesters. What, do, what should we be thinking about India's growing population? Yeah. It's, India is growing as well as China is shrinking, yes? Yeah. yeah. China's population is probably close to a peak. We don't know exactly. The, Last year, or earlier this year, when the numbers came out, it might already indicate we're at a peak, but so we're close to a peak. And in India, it's still rising, and they will take on, India will continue to rise, I think, until 2030, 40 or so. Um, in India, the situation is completely different, because in China and Indonesia, we've seen urbanization. Most people have moved to cities. So 50% of all consumption in China is done by people that are, as I mentioned, these empty nesters that live in, in cities. In, in, in India, it's almost the other way around. A large part of consumption is still rural. That is extremely difficult to penetrate. We've seen companies that sell furniture that come from Sweden. I can't mention names, but if you're a bit creative, you can get there. Uh, we've seen American auto companies. We've seen steel companies from, from, uh, from Korea trying to go into India and set up facilities there. Very often, five, 10 years, they've ripped the hair out of their heads and said, we're gone. We can't do it here. It is not easy to get into India, but if you are in India and you have that distribution capability, well, you don't have a lot of competition, you do well. The most profitable companies in Asia are actually Indonesian of Indian consumer companies. They, they don't even need cash to grow because they can tell anybody wants to sell their products to them, they distribute it. So they say, we pay you in three months time, and of course, if you buy something, you, you pay them directly. So their, their cash flow is phenomenal. They're extremely profitable. Profitability is like almost 100% for some of these companies. So that's, that's one way of thinking about investing it. You have these kind of incumbent companies that have built up a distribution capability of over 150 years sometimes that is almost in, impossible to penetrate and to replicate. So yeah, we can look at those. One of the other themes I touched upon in the beginning was the, it's been sort of a theme for my 10 years living in Hong Kong, um, the, sort of the idea of the rise of the middle class in emerging yeah. markets, increasing prosperity and wealth. Is that still a trend? Am I five years behind the curve on this one? No, I actually think that's still a, a rising trend. I mean, I arrived as a poor backpacker in 1990 in Asia. I was lucky to be backpacking in Indonesia met a family that didn't speak any English. I lived with them, they taught me Indonesian. Um, and they were a typical kind of middle class family. Mm, yeah, it wasn't always easy for them, a small budget, but they've actually done very, very well. You see now the compounding effects of that to a certain extent, and I come back to these, these uh, the, the middle class, the Chinese empty nesters are a, a proponent of that. These people now in their 40s and 50s, uh, they've done well, they've accumulated money, hey, they've got a bank account, they want to have insurance products, they, they buy more. So the, the rise in the middle class continues. Um, but the middle class is a bit older now. And that's the difference over when we came here. They're now in their 40s and 50s. It's not the 20 year old. And I see a lot of, uh, sometimes you see articles in magazine and they're talking about the middle class in China and they've got a young 
very often good looking girl on the front page that's on her phone buying stuff or comparing prices. It's actually her parents that are the big buys. It's not necessary. Maybe she got the money from her parents, I guess, but it's not the 22 year old. It's the 45 year old in China or Indonesia that is, uh, that is, uh, that is the big buyer. So that's the one we have to focus on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, one thing I wanted to bring up from the book is you talk a lot about emotions when investing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you just explain some of what you said there? and how yeah. people should control it. Yeah, because partially, if you look at markets, it's a very kind of numbers game, right? Profits, discounting, bond yields, we've spoken about all of that. And we can look at the positioning of people in, in markets and how that moves over time. But on the other hand, you simply get emotions. And um, I learned that, in a sense, maybe the hard way. Uh, I used to be an analyst in Indonesia in the mid-90s. Uh, when I arrived, I was a junior analyst. And everything was booming. It was all good. The, Indonesia was the future. I actually, in 1994, I graduated from university. I had a backpack with a couple of socks, T-shirts, and the books. That was the only thing I had. And I was a tour guide in China. And I thought, China's not going anywhere. I go to Indonesia. And Indonesia, at that time, was considered to be the future. So that's where I went. Um, it was booming. But then, hey, things went wrong. And sentiment switched. And a couple of years later, it was in what we could call adversity or revulsion. Uh, people, didn't, people took meetings with me. I was an analyst for a Swiss bank at the time. I went to Singapore, Hong Kong to talk about Indonesian stock markets. People took meetings for me out of pity, like, oh my God, oh, that's, okay, we'll take a meeting with you because who wants to invest in that place? But that's the time when actually you could buy companies that are still listed there at three times earnings, and the earnings were very low at the time. The earnings have gone up, the multiple has gone up. Some of these companies don't phenomenally well. So understanding the cycles that we have between euphoria to revulsion and the stages in between is, 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 is very helpful. And actually, that's what we kind of worked with 12 months ago. We had euphoria, you could say, in China internet. Everybody wanted to be in. Why bother to look at anything else than just to buy two or three of these larger companies? Uh, a euphoria takes these markets then on some kind of trajectory, but eventually, uh, how that then works, we don't know exactly. It shifts. The, the, something happens. It looks not so important at the time, but then the sentiment shifts, and before you know it, six months later, people say, China is uninvestable. As you said earlier on, what do I do here? This market you can't invest in. So these shifts in sentiment are very helpful to kind of an overlay. <laughs> it can be very annoying to a journalist if you're planning an article and the market moves against you, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about me. Um, look, we talked about China, India. What other markets do you think people should be looking at around the region? I mean, China and India, you can almost not, or China, you cannot avoid. Yeah. What India, actually, you, you should not avoid because over the last 20 years, the market has done the best. It's consistently a very good performer. One of the things, um, when I came into Asia and started as an analyst in 1995, it was all about Asian tigers, growth economies, and stuff like that. But our stock markets in Asia haven't done as good as actually the US. So that's a, a painful truth. And there's an old discussion why that is the case. But India has actually consistently done very well. So it's a market we shouldn't ignore. But I think the market that is really interesting at the moment is actually two, maybe three actually at the top of my head. First, Indonesia. In Indonesia, there's a lot of things going on. Coal prices are up. It's good for rural Indonesia. Indonesia is chock full with nickel which everybody who makes a battery needs these days. So there's a lot of money flowing in. Indonesia's problem was always that there was no money flowing in, so the currency would be weak. And therefore, this, yeah, it benefits the currency to a certain extent. That means that the interest rates in Indonesia can stay lower. We see a lot of retailers in Indonesia for the first time stepping into the stock market. And there are tech companies in Indonesia starting to list as well. So that market is interestingly becoming very diverse. The other two markets that I had in my head is Vietnam and Bangladesh. I don't know who anybody has been in Bangladesh here, but I've met people who've invested in Asia for 30, 35 years and said, oh, I've been everywhere in Indonesia. You say, have you been in Mongolia? Oh, I've been in Mongolia. Oh, I've been in West China. Have you been in Dhaka? No, no, I haven't been in Dhaka. Most people haven't been in Dhaka and don't seem to be interested to go there either. But Bangladesh is a market that is easy to invest in, surprisingly, really? yes. Easy to invest Easy in. Easy in terms of rules and technology? Uh, rules, and, uh, yeah, and you can just open an account and you can, you can, you can buy stock there. It's 200, I think it's about close to 200 million people. It's one of the largest rising consumer markets on the planet. 
at the Brookings Institute did a nice report not so long ago whereby they looked at the increases in kind of people that earn over uh, 2,000 US dollars uh, a month in, in different markets, because that's where consumption really takes off. Bangladesh came out at number four on the planet. So it's, it's a market that is really interesting and developing and nobody's really looking at. So that's, uh, we try to put a little more focus on that. So if I'd say, if you look at markets, Indonesia is easy, but Bangladesh, don't forget about that one either. Well, you heard it here pretty much probably first. Um, uh, probably, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm aware of the time, and I'm sure there are some questions. So if there is a question already over here, the microphone will be coming around. Uh, usual drill, please state name and affiliation. Uh, two together, we'll take the, that gentleman first and then the other. Thank you very much. My name is John Antweiler. I'm retired, but I worked for banks my entire life. Um, okay. <laughs> my <laughs> apologies. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, as you talked about all the forces driving the markets and whatnot, you didn't really talk too much about political risk and mm. how we ought to be thinking about political risk as it impacts the equity markets mm. and really as we look forward um, in the next two, three, five, ten years. Um, some mm. of the political risks we ought to be concerned about. Yeah. wonder if you could talk about that. Uh, I can. As an equity strategist, what is important to me, I'm not a political analyst, so it's important to me to understand what political risk is important to stock markets. So I go back to what I said earlier on. Stock markets are basically a large discounting machine. You look at profits, you look at uh, sentiment as well, but you look at profits and you look at bond yields. So the question is, you take any political event, is it relevant to either those profits or is it relevant to the, the, the bond yields? Uh, sometimes the simple answer is, no, oh, it's not really relevant. You might have an election and there are two candidates, but to be honest, the profits of companies that sell telecom uh, products or companies that sell uh, food and beverages or companies that run railways or tech companies is not really impacted by whoever is the president of that country. So sometimes the profits are not impacted. However, if you've got two candidates whereby one says, I'm going to really go after the banks and I want to regulate them or the tech companies or whatever companies they have, yeah, then of course that political risk is more relevant. So we have to understand how it actually impacts these, uh, these, uh, th these markets. A nice example is, of course, what happened in China this year. Uh, regulatory issues have been a big issue for the internet sector. That is a clear political risk that is very difficult to forecast. And that's why markets very often take an almost binary approach. We know that there is a risk. We don't know how to deal with it. It might happen, but we'll deal with it when we get to that bridge and then we price it in very quickly. So I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but that's the way I try to approach it. There was another gentleman on this table first. Hello, my name is Andrew Haskins. I worked with Harold a long time ago. Yeah, but, uh, ago <laughs> about 15. Yeah, great yeah, great 15, to see yeah, you again, yeah. and thank you for your talk today. Andrew. You touched on this point very briefly, but uh, I would like to ask about it further. Over the past 20 years or so, the US stock market has relentlessly outperformed most Asian stock markets. Maybe India is an exception, but most uh, Asian stock markets. Over the past year, I think the S&P 500 has outperformed the Shanghai index by about 20 percentage points and the Hang Seng more, yeah. by about 30 percentage yeah, points. Yeah. What explains that the massive underperformance of most Asian yeah. markets, given that they are growing uh, yeah. and the demographic trends seem to favor uh, the countries in this region? Yeah. And when will that change? When will Asia start to outperform the US? Good. Uh, well, your question is twofold in a sense because you say over the last 20 years Asia hasn't done so well and also over the last year. Um, if we look at it over the longer run, Asia has underperformed, that is correct. So if you would put money aside uh, over the last 20 years passively, you put in, buy an ETF or a fund, and you don't look at it, the US stock market has simply done better. If you break it down a little bit and you look at has actually America outgrown, have American companies grown faster than Asian companies? The answer is actually yes. 
they've grown a little bit faster, not so much, but they've grown a little bit faster than uh, the average Asian company. So that story, what I said when I arrived in, the, in, in, in Asia in the early 90s about uh, growing economies, that's right, but the earnings growth of companies has not been, uh, that has not been so strong. But there are two things that's important to notice. Asian stock markets move much more. Secondly, the divergence in stock prices, some going up a lot and other ones collapsing, is much, much wider. So if you are a passive investor, you just put money aside. To be honest, the US has and might well be continue to be a good place to be in the longer run. If you go a little bit deeper and you say you're willing to look at markets a bit deeper and look at, see how markets move. Take India and, and, and China, for example. China's done like this, India's done like that. Now, then you can say, will there be some mean reversion eventually over the longer run? Now, you could argue that might well take place. That's the way to make money. You have to be much more active. So if you're an institutional investor, you need to be very active in Asia. You need to be tactical. Uh, decisions, you need to look at timing, you need to look at sentiment, you need to look at changes in, in earnings patterns much more so than, uh, than in the US. Then actually the Asian markets could do much, much better. If you, if you use that, you could do much better. So if you talk about funds, very often they found it easier to make money in Asia than in the US. A quick follow up from me, why are Asia's markets so much more volatile? I think partially because it's, it's a lot of geography, but it's so different, right? The Indian consumer markets and the Chinese consumer market, the demographics are very different. The regulatory environment is different. Um, competition very often in certain industries is very different. In, for example, telecom can be cutthroat in India, but in the Philippines, it's three cozy companies that really carved each other up. So it's an oligopoly. They're really profitable. Well, actually, not as much as they should be, but it's a different story altogether. So you have all these different uh, dynamics, and industries move a lot here. Uh, Indian telecom, for a long time, was a big growth industry. We're talking about, the, say, the early 2000s. And then there were so many players coming in, including some with enormously big pockets and rich families, that created an extremely competitive industry whereby a lot of people said, uh, we're going to pull out. And now that's consolidated, and actually the three that have left are very profitable. So you see big swings in industries as well, even more so than in the US. So that's, that's where you can make your money. Okay, um, I want to make sure, any questions over this side? There's a question in the back. The question in the back there, so go to the veranda. So I just know that the guys on this side sometimes get a tougher mm -hmm. game if you don't look round. They're going to really wave. Hi. Um, Hatim Hussain Ali, retired private investor. Uh, during lunch, Bitcoin has soared to an all-time high. Mm. Uh, crypto assets seem to be dominating the financial news. People want to understand it, but I don't think many people do. Uh, do you have a view on digital crypto assets? Should the layman have a degree of exposure to Bitcoin, for example, as well as stocks and bonds? Yeah. I'll be very frank. I have try to read a lot about Bitcoin. I try to understand the technology behind it, and, and so far I can understand it. Blockchain, there's all kinds of benefits to it. I just don't understand Bitcoin very well. I'm just very traditional. I look at what does an asset give me, what, are the, what do I get of it right now in terms of profits, or dividends, or rental, over the next years as well. Um, I've long struggled, we actually I spoke with this with my colleagues about this this morning, to understand gold. Why? Why do gold prices move? What is so interesting about gold, aside the, the fact that some people think it's got a nice color, it's got a bit shiny. You could say that about a lot of other metals as well. Why isn't that the case? Until I, a chemist once told me gold is the only metal on the planet that even if you have an atomic war, it will not break. It's actually made in supernovas. So gold is something special. It is the only thing that probably will be around whatever happens. So you could argue, okay, then it's a safety thing. But it took me 20 years, or maybe a little bit shorter, 10 years or so, to get there. I have the same with, with, uh, with, with, with Bitcoin. What, what is it do I get out of Bitcoin? I don't get anything. What is it? Of course, these prices move up as people believe it should go up. And some prominent people make comments on it and stuff like that. And the analogy I make is actually go back to history where we started off in 1740, I think it was. People in Amsterdam sold apartments to buy tulip bulbs. And at the time, in 1739, you would have made money. And said, you are nuts. 
not to sell your house and buy tulip bulbs. I have doubled my money in tulip bulbs. And you would have looked really clever. Yeah? Now, a little bit later, we know that it was actually property that was the good bet, and tulip bulbs don't really, yeah, they perish, and a few years later, it all fell apart. I'm not saying that's the case with, with Bitcoin, but a tulip bulb gives you simply a flower that eventually perishes. What is the value in it? And yes, I can see that a lot of people say, oh, there's a lot of value in it, and therefore these prices move. I have the same with Bitcoin. I just don't know what it exactly is. Now, if it would be used as a currency everywhere, you could go downstairs, buy a beer, uh, pay Bitcoin, wherever you do, and you can say, hey, this maybe I can see that there would be value in it. But at the moment, that's quite difficult, actually. So, so I don't see. So I'm careful. But my son says, you're nuts, you're old, you don't know anything. I'm in crypto, and he's made money. And he says, you've been in markets for such a long time, I've made more money than you this year. Actually, he's wrong, but this doesn't matter. But, uh, so yes, I, I can't, <laughs> that, that's the way it is. So I stay away from it myself. Well, I can safely say, as far as I know, there's no plans to allow you to pay your FCC bills or Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin yeah. just yeah. yet, <laughs> so you're aware. Um, another question, we've got one over here. Oh, the, yeah. Sorry, the light's bright, we can't always see. Yeah, the sun coming in. Hello, Hero. I think we might have just met on Sunday. And um, Roger says, hello. My name is Shirley, and I'm a write I was a writer for SCMP. In terms of asset allocation, you mentioned about India, Hong Kong, United States. So what would your advice be to allocate, let's say, equity or bond with my $100 in the pocket? OK. So I purely look at equities at the moment. So I allocate money within, within equities. I think uh, my rule of thumb, in, and I tell this to my son and my friends, any money you have you don't use for the next five years, 90% of that, I think, should be in equities. And then you've got to figure out where it is. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm biased in that sense. Uh, for the moment, if you would make that judgment, just looking at what the house calls are, we actually think bond yields are going to go down over the course of the next 12 months or so, 6 to 12 months. Um, that would be positive for bonds, actually. So uh, in that sense, we have a bias within HMC, that is, to, uh, to bonds for the moment over equities because they perform so well. Does that answer your question? Sort of, <laughs> in more detail. Within equities, uh, it's, it's publicly well known, we, we like China at the moment, so uh, uh, that's the, the market that we think you should be focusing on. Okay, um, we have another question on the veranda here. Yeah, hi. You can see me now. Ah, yes. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Jan, I'm a dentist. So I want to ask you one question. We both agree that Chinese economy has done better than India's economy. Do we agree? Over the last 10 years, 20 years? It's grown faster. Okay. Then why is there a disparity that the Chinese stocks haven't done well and India's has? Yeah. Comparatively. Yeah. So this comes back to what I said earlier on. If we talk about markets, we should, in particular in Asia, not start with a what is the GDP? And wherefore, what would these markets do? We have to look at it from the ground up. India has got, a, I would say, two key advantages. And I can't look at the gentleman because he sits behind the wall, but I just assumed he's there. Um, <laughs> you're back. Um, India has, if you look at the top 100 companies that have done the best over the last 10 or 20 years in Asia, two sorts of companies emerge, and India is quite rich in them. Firstly, it is companies that have become global leaders in their respective industries. I'll give you a nice one. There's a Taiwanese, very well-known Taiwanese bicycle company. I can't mention names, but there's, there's two of them. But if you Google it, you can find at least one of them. But both of them do very well. The bicycle industry is a low growth industry. It doesn't grow really fast. Actually, it's about 3% growth a year. Still, these companies don't phenomenally well because they're innovative. They've moved up kind of with new products. They gained market share. And they've done phenomenally well and therefore belong to the best performing market. So if you can become a global leader, you can actually have your scale benefits are so good that you could do well. India has got that in pharma, it's got it in IT, and it's got it in certain kind of technical component makers as well. The second group of companies that have done very well over the last 10 and 20 years are companies that are domestic brands with a phenomenal network. Um, Chinese internet companies actually fit into that. But the Indians as well, if you've got some of the Indian 
uh, FMCG companies, so uh, fast-moving consumer good companies, that have, as I said earlier on, a distribution network that is almost impossible to replicate and makes them extremely profitable, and therefore they've done very well. So India, its economy is not as exciting, as not grown as fast as China, absolutely right, but the nature of the companies and the industries in India have allowed these companies to do so much better. India has significantly outperformed, actually, depends on what you measure as China. Is that Hong Kong, China, Asia market? They're more China market. But if you take some kind of weighted average between all the Chinese companies listed on different exchanges, it has done better over the last 20 years because it's been able to be, create more global leaders and have these domestic giants that do so well. Okay, well, we're coming up to two o'clock, so I have a gazillion more questions, and I'm sorry for those of you I haven't got to so far, um, but I'm aware of everyone's time constraints. So it just remains for me to say, uh, of course, if you've got more questions for Harold, the best thing to do would be to buy his book and then grab him next time you see him in the bar, and you can get some personal advice Absolutely. there. Um, but thank the, you very much. the book is here. I've also let QR codes, just to let you know, uh, the proceeds, my proceeds of the book, not the published receipts, will go into a charity on financial uh, literacy. Uh, the whole idea of the book is that you can reach financial independence if you know a little bit about investing. The book tries to make people comfortable with doing that in Asian stock markets, and then hopefully some other people will benefit from that as well. That's an excellent ideal and a good goal to have. Thank you very much, Harold, for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and of course, I get to present you the ever-elegant FCC bag. Oh, fantastic. Small gift. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. A pleasure. Okay.